People think that the history of science is about who, who did it first. And I must dispel you of this notion, the history and philosophy of science is not about who did it first. The history and the philosophy of science basically seeks to identify patterns, laws, uh, patterns and the mechanisms of the growth of scientific knowledge. And the philosophy of science basically tries to um, unpack the presuppositions, the philosophical, cultural, metaphysical and other presuppositions that shape the growth of scientific knowledge. Uh, now having said that, the past 20 years has been a particularly uh, exciting period for those who do research in the history and philosophy of science uh, for a variety of reasons. And I'm not going to inventory all the reasons that are cause for much excitement in the field, but uh, identify one of the problems around which I shall speak for maybe the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, otherwise, one can go on much longer. As, as we begin to see that the world is more and more connected, what is becoming evident is that the connections that underlie the world of knowledge production themselves have become the subject of deep investigation from historians and philosophers of science. And connections that go so deep, you know, I mean, we tend to think that, well, the world was globalized over the last, has been globalized over the last 40 years. No, the world's been globalized for centuries. It's just the rate at which knowledge is transmitted and circulated today is almost, well, instantaneous at the click of a mouse, all right? If you went back to ancient Greece or ancient India or ancient Rome, I mean, people were still trading in ideas, goods, materials, artifacts. But these processes took a long period, a much, much longer period, but not as long as we expected. And so, I mean, of late, historians and philosophers are all talking about global histories, connected histories, entangled histories, hybrid knowledge. What are these categories and concepts about? These categories and concepts are basically uh, invented by historians and philosophers of science to get a handle. And not every concept gets a good handle. As we know with concepts, some concepts provide us an analytical perspective which allows us to access one part but not access to another which enables us to acquire an insight into one angle, one perspective, one dimension, but not in... in so what we have then is a, is a family, an entire range of concepts to deal with this connected, these connected histories. So I, I was about uh, 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 two years ago at a workshop in, in Beijing, and uh, one of my colleagues whose work I'm going to cite, called Karin Chemra from the University of Paris, was asked by a Chinese, you know, I mean, uh, you are a French mathematician, so what is the identity? How will you define the identity of a French mathematician? And Karin Schemler said very, very knowledgeably, well, the mathematics I do has roots which I can trace back to ancient Greece, ancient China, ancient India, the ancient Arab world. My citizenship is French. All right, but my knowledge has roots like a tree, like a rhizome, you know, under the ground, which go back to several connected knowledges. All right, and so I mean, uh, uh, what we begin to see then is, is that it's very difficult then to ascribe a very unique label to a kind of knowledge, because if the world was connected, these roots of knowledge is also being connected. All right, and I myself, uh, for, uh, for some time, have been interested in this this guy. You all know of him. Anybody living in Delhi, you know, who visits Kanot Place has seen the Jantar Mantar. Anybody who's been to Jaipur, you've all heard of Jai Singh. And I try to understand his observatory. Now, what we see is that there are many sites of knowledge. What is a site of knowledge? An observatory is a site of knowledge. All right, a library is a site of knowledge. A university is a site of knowledge. And what we as historians of science have begun to realize is that the sites of knowledge are far more distributed and dispersed within society that, than we had ever thought before. All right? We seem to think, and that's because of the history of the last 200 years, that oh, all the knowledge we produce is produced in, in, in institutes and in universities and in research laboratories. No. 
knowledge is produced in different sectors of society and in all these sectors in, so, in some cases the integration between the sectors is very strong and in some cases the integration is not so strong. So in the next seven to eight minutes let me just now instantiate some of the things I've been trying to say through the work of this man. Um, and in order to understand the work of this man, I mean, I tried, I tried to develop a concept which I call cosmopolitan science. And you say, what is cosmopolitan? The work, of course, it derives from the ancient Greeks who said, well, well, cosmopolitan is a kind of citizen of the world. A cosmopolitan individual is one who has an openness to other cultures, other peoples, other societies, and other ways of knowing. Now, in sociological theory, people seem to think that cosmopolitanism, the ideology of being cosmopolitan, is something which emerges in Europe in the 18th century. And I've been part of a program with scholars from the Arab world, from India and, and, and all that, and saying, no, we were always cosmopolitan, but in a way, we are not yet. The world of knowledge production has always been cosmopolitan in a certain way. So, how do I instantiate it? So I go to this ruler called Jai Singh and the astronomical observatory as we know it, as we know it today, where people make a fixed site where people make observations, where there are texts from different languages which, which pass through that contains tables of astronomical observations, where people who are trained to do astronomy uh, teach and there are people who translate observations and principles from one language into another. This is something which was an invention of 8th, 9th century Baghdad and it travels in two directions. It travels into the, uh, to the west which goes on to become the modern observatory with the telescope and it travels eastward and it influences the design of the observatory of Jai Singh, the Jantar Mantar. And for Jai Singh, this man was the greatest astronomer ever. His name is Uluk Beg. And in Samarkand, this is the observatory of Uluk Beg. And based on this, Jai Singh says, that, well, Uluk Beg's system is not perfect, and I shall perfect it, just like the knowledge we possess today is not perfect, and the next generation will perfect it, all right? So that is the destiny of knowledge, all right? That is how knowledge ad advances. Something goes out, and something new comes in, and so he goes to the work of U Uluk Beg, and then in trying to deal with Uluk Beg's calculations, he says, I cannot resolve the problem. So what do I do? So, he has an observatory, the site of knowledge, in which he has nine astronomers, Jyotisha, working, alongside nine Nujumi, nine astronomers trained in Islamic astronomy, and they're working together. All right, so astronomers like Jagannath Samrat and Kevil Rama are working along with Abdul Khair Mohandas, trying to perfect the tables of, of Ulag Beg. The problem still is not going away. And what does this man do then? He writes to the governor of Goa, a Portuguese official, and says, send me some uh, European astronomers. I want to see what they are doing. And this then becomes the route for the entry of modern astronomy to India. And he employs then two astronomers from Bavaria in Germany to work in his laboratory. Now, if I look at this astronomical site, and say, what is it? What label can I put on it? What is its identity? There is over here the mixing of both people and things. The people are coming from different traditions, all right, from different ways of doing astronomy. Jyotisha, the Najumi, and or the Ilm al -Haya, and those who are doing Western astronomy, all right. There is also a cosmopolitanism of things, of objects, of instruments. There are objects, there are instruments which are being used. And these are instruments which some of which Jai Singh had developed himself. And some of which came back from a tradition which went back at least two or three centuries. But which were going through a process of evolution and change. So there are these astronomical instruments. He sends a delegation to Portugal who come back with a modern telescope with the vernier calipers and ways of doing astronomy which date back to the 17th century, to the Europe of the 17th century. All right, so what do we see here? And then there are the tables across five different traditions. 
And so there are works which are being translated from several languages. The Almagest is translated into Sanskrit by a Pandit of his called Jagannath Samrat. And I think Samrat is his Takhalus, his title. All right, it's a title given to him for having translated the, the Almagest into, into Sanskrit. So there are texts which are being translated from Latin into Sanskrit, from Persian into Sanskrit across different languages. So there are different kinds of objects. The observatory becomes a site where people from different cultures, from different nations, from different ways of doing things, texts which are in different languages, things which come from different traditions, all these are passing through, are passing through that observatory. All right, the observatory itself is a site of a cosmopolitan knowledge. All right, and if that be the case, how do I label it? Is this Jyotisha? Is this Ilmalaya? Is this modern science? All right, and this kind of engagement within the sciences, this kind of pragmatism within the sciences is what has been responsible for the rapid growth of modern science. All right, so now, however, let me come to my last problem and I think I'll begin winding up is, what have historians of science seen over the past two decades? And what they've seen over the past two decades is that the term science itself is too narrow a term to encompass this diversity this diversity of knowledge producers. Because the moment you talk about science, you talk about an institution like the university, departments and disciplines, physics, chemistry, mathematics, biochemistry, biophysics, you talk about all these departments. And actually, no, the, nat the nature of these interactions has taken place across several kinds of institutional contexts, which is not limited just to the university. And so now people like me say, no, I'm not a historian of science, I'm a historian of knowledge. All right, because the term knowledge itself gives you a greater latitude to explore domains of knowledge which are not limited by the term science itself. It's not that science is any less important. It is equally important. But science itself is networked with other ways of knowing and acting upon the world. I think uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>